Um, so to heal that, let, let me speak first to, this is stuck in my memory. It's not just my brain, but in my yeah, total memory. It, yeah, because it's not, it's not memory as an intellectual right. repository. It's actually physical. It's, yes, it's in every cell of my body. Right. And to access that needs be, I need to be in my body. And raised in the environment I was raised in, the society I was raised in, men are to not cry, be tough, quit your whining, get the job done. Um, I don't care how you feel, which is reasonable to producing, uh, having a living, producing something. Okay, that's reasonable. But when I take that same thing into a relationship, it's not about production, it's about being something in with some other person and i didn't know how to do that i knew how to get things done i knew how to fix things um and that's what i kept doing and the harder i tried to be a good one of those a good man the further away from whatever partner i was with at the time the further away from her i got and i, I just didn't understand what was going on until i realized that oh my god i don't even see my own value because I can't because of this belief that there's something wrong with me. Um, and that all of that is hooked into survival. Fight, flight, freeze, please. So I found myself in a situation at home with somebody who said they love me. And I said, I love you. Fighting over who left the spoon on the table. It's like, um, and then me going to some extreme high intensity energy instead of going, uh, I didn't, and I'm willing to pick it up, uh, just going to being proactive, I would go into some kind of avoidant behavior, which for me was leaving the room or raising my voice, being louder than the other person, um, instead of well, whatever was in my subconscious is looking out for whatever happened to create the pain and um, it doesn't tell time. So I bring that unresolved trauma in the space with me now and I don't know it. And I'm reacting to this trauma instead of having the ability to be present in the room. Um, the Trauma mixed up with this. I don't know if I mentioned reticular activating system. No, not yet. Okay, this reticular activating system is a alert mechanism for danger. In my subconscious, somebody walking out the door is danger. So I'm in an argument. My partner walks out the door. I flip out. And I don't know why. Uh, I know she's outside on the other side of the door. She's getting in the car, should be back. I know all that. And yet I'm acting like it's the end. Uh, it's never going to change. Um, and I'm powerless. I'm a victim. <clears throat> um, so when that hooks into the, it's part of the survival mechanism, which alerts me to danger. So it kicks in my adrenals because the little guy is going to die if they don't come back, which is true. Um, um, and my adrenals put me in a reactive response, fight, flight, freeze, or please, fawning. So when you say, so hold on one second, if you would, just yeah. for the newcomer. So when you talk about the adrenals, what you're talking about, if I tell me if I'm wrong, you're talking about an actual physical experience, not, yes. not a mental experience. No which again is why it's so important for us to get into the feeling body. Right. Because it's, it's, that's where, that's where we lived as little kids when these original traumas were occurring. Right. When that, when mom left the room and I got that energy of, of, uh, you know, I can't survive. I'm all alone, whatever. Like you said earlier, I think you said that wasn't a thought in my, no. that was my whole body reacting. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, if, as you said, um, also, if upon the return, 
the, the mom didn't recognize that I'd had a traumatic experience and addressed it. Right. With soothing talk or whatever, pick, being held so that the trauma could get released. Then it stuck perpetually because you said it doesn't tell time. No. It hasn't been discharged. It's still there. Yes. So <clears throat> in that state as an infant, I was in an adrenaline state. Um, when I become, when I get into an adrenaline state as an adult, the adrenaline state is to get me out of my feeling body so I can react. Like, we'll use the example, saber tooth tiger is approaching. I can't, like, oh, I'm scared of that. That guy's going to beat me. No, no, you react. You, it's automatic, subconscious, boom, run. Unless you have a, I don't know, a spirit and you're a saber tooth tiger hunter, you're like excited he's coming because you're going to get him. That's all chemistry. Right. Okay. The chemistry is adrenals, which takes you out of your emotional body, takes you out of the situation. Instead of a saber tooth tiger, it's my loving partner coming to ask me a question. I don't want her to ask me. I don't want to answer it and she becomes a saber tooth tiger, I get flushed with adrenaline and I'm in a reactive mode. That's with me slamming doors, yelling, um, withholding, becoming silent for like weeks at a time. That's all adrenaline. And it's serving the purpose of my survival and yet it doesn't know that I'm not there anymore. I'm here now at 45 years old or 74 years old and I'm okay, I'm safe this doesn't know it um so i it also gets you out of your rational mind thinking mind into reactive um if somebody's driving down the road for an example and a car swerves over towards them they automatically react before they think about i'm going to pull the wheel over. the wheels over and it's already happened before they're conscious about it i don't know there's a study that it's like a millisecond before it registers, you're in an action. That's what we're talking about, unresolved childhood trauma. I'm in a reactive state before it, I be even become um, conscious of the, the reaction. Um, and not knowing, not knowing that was going on, not knowing I had unresolved trauma that didn't have any words, that was a feeling tone, um, that's supposed to alert me to danger. That's its job. But the danger is past, only I don't know it. So I'm acting as if that danger just happened and all that and somebody left the room and I'm freaking out or I'm judging or or I'm leaving. I'm, I'm the one leaving them, leaving the room, slamming the door or trying to get away. Um, well, I wish we could get this all clear in one of our sessions, just one, just one session. Like I have a, that's why we talk about this over and over and over, because every time we talk about it, and depending on the context, right now we're talking about the context of a newcomer. How, how do you explain this? Or what would they expect? Um, something new comes up around this dynamic issue. It's, it's huge. Um, and we, we put the pieces of the puzzle together one piece at a time. And pretty soon we'll have a, a picture of, oh, oh, that's what you're talking about. Oh, I see it now. Um, um, sometimes I use the analogy like I'm up on the board talking French to people who speak English. <laughs> and they're going, what, what is he saying? What, what did he say? what's this particular what? Uh, some people have never heard that word, particular acumen. said they don't even know that it's part of their physiology that's keeping them alive. Um, and there's a lot I don't know still. So, and I do the best I can with the information I have to, and I'm always looking for different ways to explain this, uh, different ways, different analogies, different metaphors, different ways of saying this so that somebody listening to me just something clicks it's like an aha when i hear somebody in a group 
after I've explained something or they've gone through a process and they just simply say, wow, that's it. Whatever that whoa, whatever that was, that was an experience in your body. Because we, we don't have the words for it. We talk about it being pre-verbal and a lot of it after we learn to talk, we didn't have the words to express it. So it's nonverbal. And yet there's a a pattern of behavior that happens consistently in whatever the issue is. It's consistent. That consistency tells me whatever, like running out the door, slamming things, screaming, yelling, alcohol ingestion, or that consistency speaks to the unknown inside me. Um, so that's part of the process is owning, owning where you're at. I don't know if I want to go there right now, but it's, um, oh, one of the ways I talk to people, how, somebody asked me one time, I was trying to explain it to them and they got frustrated. And they go, oh, just say one sentence, one sentence, tell me what you do. And I go, oh, I demystify behaviors. I take the mystery out of why you do what you do and take the mystery out of it. I do this because this happened. Has to be. That's like Sherlock Holmes. This happened. This is the result. If you eliminate all the pl plausible and impossible things, whatever's left has got to be it because this don't happen without this somehow, some way. And I take that a step further because I wrote a book about this. Uh, and I say, having demystified your beha behavior, I'm going to show you how you are the creator of your life. Correct. And you are the creator of everything in your life. Everything in your life. Perception, Maybe. thought, beliefs, everything. Yeah. And, and including that world out there. Yes. The results. Exactly. So for me, that uh, without getting too far ahead of the game here, uh, the ultimate value of the accountability practice for me has been to put me in touch at the feeling level with the truth that I am the creator of my life and being the, then you're the creator of your life and my family members are the creators of their lives and the, and the politicians and the mm -hmm. business owners and the, the protesters on the street, they're all creators of their lives. We now have the basis for creating community. Yes. If we, as we, live in that understanding and appreciation of each other that we are living on a planet of eight billion incredible creators of life creators of the world mm -hmm. that most of us don't have any clue that we have this incredible power right and so one of the one of the values and i'd, I'd like to i'd like to have you walk us through the the accountability practice itself uh in the we have about 15 minutes here because that process, which is a here and now process, this is not some kind of esoteric, this is not being in a cave, chanting Zen or whatever. Right. This is a here and now embodied process. It's messy because yep. uh, my life is messy, um, but it is a change process. Yep. Change occurs when we do the accountability practice. Yeah. If, if you would make me um co-host i can bring the board up all right second oh wait a minute i can do it this way okay go ahead okay you got it thanks everybody for letting us do technology yes Okay, so just for a recap, th this is what we've been talking about, the reticular activating systems inside our brain, mid brainstem midbrain, that that part of our brain that doesn't need... Screen, can you make the screen larger? There you How's go. that? Okay. This is um, my experiences, which is like an iceberg. One tenth is conscious things I can bring to mind. Nine tenths is that subconscious part of ourselves where we hold our trauma, which feeds information to the reticular activating system. The thing that alerts us to danger 
and based on my childhood trauma, some of leaving the room is danger, uh, although there's no words for it, which is hooked into the survival mechanism. If I believe I'm in danger, consciously or subconsciously, I will react in a way in the fight, flight, freeze, please mode based on body chemistry. Subconscious danger information, this perceives it as danger, I go into reactive, which results in codependency, addiction, or some type of avoidant behavior, that screaming, yelling, leaving. Um, so if I know this is happening and I find myself here, the way I found to resolve the motivation for the, what's here is to simply own the here and now, knowing that it came from me. I created this for whatever reason, and probably good reason based on where I came from in my childhood trauma, that I was addicted because that saved my life. It gave me some relief in a constant, what we would call hypervision or adrenaline state uh, of uh, what I used to call it, uh, I had low side, low grade suicidal tendencies and um, uh, social anxiety. That's what I called it. I didn't like people. I didn't like being around people. They confused me. Um, and I always had this, uh, I would take, I would do risky stuff. So I called that low grade. That's all reactive from something I didn't have any idea what it was. And so, like you said, it's all, it's all chemistry. It's all chemistry. I'm in a stressor, whatever the stressors are. One of them is adrenaline. There's cortisoids. There's, I don't know all the different names for the stressors, but they're, uh, they're a cocktail of stressors. And um, so if I own where I'm at, knowing this, that it came from me somehow, some way, you just own the truth here. And I bring it up into the, what we call the accountability tree process. Blame-free, judgment-free. The example I use, I'm, quote, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. And just say the truth. Finally, no excuse, no rationale. No, I drink no matter what the consequences are for me. And the consequences are dire. I would still choose to drink. That's the, the definition of addiction. That's a short definition of addiction continuing use despite the consequences of destruction and separation so okay that's my truth i'm an alcoholic well take a breath people ask me how do you be blame free and judgment free if you're some kind of like loser alcoholic <laughs> well <laughs> i agree in the breath when i say that truth and i consciously take a deep breath i'm not in my rational mind i'm in my body in my body is the motivational factors trauma which led to the addiction i feel that i don't have words for that I, I may not even know how to express what i feel i feel something i'm in a frequency of awareness that doesn't have words of how do i describe that feeling of relief a feeling of, I call it a sloughing. It's like almost things slough off of me. Well, that truth validated the trauma, which my mother wasn't able to do, my father wasn't able to do, my teachers were not able to do. Validate, because they didn't know it, I didn't know it, I didn't know how to express it, let alone validate it. So in that truth, as encoded in it, the trauma that caused it. So in that, truth breath i'm in my feeling body i'm in an emotion i'm in a feeling tone and then i i finish it up by saying what i want in the form of in using the word i intend based on that specific truth i'm an alcoholic oh what do i what do i intend to do well, at that moment, when I first realized that and spoke that truth, my intention was to come back to where I found relief, which was a 12-step meeting. So that worked. I didn't know how to say it back then. 
36 years ago. I did feel it. I, it happened. And what I've done is taken what happened and put it in a formula. So I could go here to the results and own anything about this, things I don't like about myself. They call them character defects. Codependency is a character defect. In other words, I depend on somebody else for my well-being instead of being self-actualized in my own welfare. I depend on somebody else. Okay, I'm codependent. This happens again. I intend to be self-actualized. I intend to be kind to myself. I intend to forgive myself for the codependent actions that led me here. I intend to forgive myself. <coughs> that goes again back into the subconscious <clears throat> validates the trauma and we're just talking feeling now i could remember a trauma specific to what i'm saying here is the truth either quote a penis here i could i most of the time i don't i don't know there's a myriad of things that happen between con conception and seven years old let's say 12 years old that are stuck in there this truth addresses those that's why i have under here self-validation this process validates me blame free judgment free i want to speak a little bit about what i what that really means is i give myself what my parents couldn't give me which is simply seeing me and hearing me without a condition of it being right or not irritating <laughs> or I, I can look at my grandson and he could be flipping out over something and, and i see him and, and i recognize talking? i validate him how old are we talking about so people know well he's eight years old and he's been receiving this for eight years okay and from me and from his mother, because his mother knows this information too, that he gets to feel whatever he's feeling. Like he would say to me sometimes, I don't like you. Well, oh, I, okay, I'm hearing you say you don't like me. I, because I'm the guy between him and his mom. If I come over, his mom would leave. I, he doesn't want to see me. So he gets to express the best way he knows how is I don't like you. Okay, I'm hearing you say I don't you don't like me. I understand because usually when I come your mom leaves and I know you don't like to see your mom leave. No, don't talk to me. I'm, okay, I, I see you. You're angry. I, I say a word a feeling word and validate him and um, He gets He's not I don't um, Redefine him I allow him to feel so he can experience himself in a feeling and not be not appropriate it's age appropriate for him his mom leaving no matter who's there is not okay he likes his mom the most okay in fact he even told me that i like my mom better than you <laughs> i said that's reasonable i understand that that's reasonable for you to like your mom that much i didn't say no you can't talk to me that way no you're stupid oh it's just for a minute is she gonna be right back i didn't explain all that to him because he's in a feeling tone and I validate it. So when I come here and I say, I'm mean, I give myself the same thing I'm giving my grandson. Yes, I see you. Yes, I, yes, you're mean. And based on where you came from, that's in alignment with that. Now, does me being mean create separation and destruction? Yes. Does it create a feeling of isolation and loneliness in me? Yes. It is not out of alignment with trauma, childhood trauma. So I just say it, I mean, take my breath. This happens, the emotion happens. That's where I talk about feeling the sloughing. And then I go, I, I think to myself, I wanna be kind and I'm a sticker on using that word intent. So I intend to be kind. That action, that feeling tone goes into my subconscious again takes the edge of these are fish hooks uh, my idea of fish hooks 
takes the edge off the hook or disappears the hook. I don't know, but it changes it. It validates that pain that doesn't know how to tell time in the present moment. When I say my truth, my truth, blame free, judgment free, healing. I feel my power and I'm choosing. I'm at choice. Where before I was in judgment. Oh, that's stupid. I shouldn't have done that. How come I did that? Why are they always? That's so validating. That's intentional. And I feel different. I, I call it freedom. That's the end result for me. Freedom from what? Childhood trauma. Fixed beliefs, perceptions, and patterns that are keeping me stuck in this behavior. I find freedom from those and insert like you said we're creators based on the information gathered from my childhood i created this oh if i own this what do i want i intend to live in peace i intend to be kind yes and this one of the promises of the program is you will come to a life you never knew possible this process brings me to things that I couldn't do on my own, my own volition. I couldn't do with all the information I had about right, wrong, good, bad, all this stuff stuck in my subconscious. The harder I tried not to, whatever this was, the more I found myself entrenched in it when I simply owned it, blame free, judgment free. I could then add to and change the results automatically. If I created this and I own that, I'm a creator. It sucks. I'm, I'm telling you, this, this results column is unpleasant. But if I own that I created it, what do I want? Oh, I intend to live in peace. I intend to be kind. I intend to be gracious. I intend to live. I intend to, oh, thrive instead of survive. This enabled me to survive but I wasn't thriving. The life I, I come to a life I never knew possible. I'm thriving. I'm still in the struggle. I'm not alone. And I'm able to emotionally regulate frustration tolerance, which I didn't have before through this practice. I've gained the capacity to regulate my emotions, to notice when I'm alerted. Instead of acting on it, I take a breath. Because I know I oh I just got a shot of adrenaline and what that does is create I don't want that so I take a breath calm down okay I'm lucid and and I got all that through this practice I call it the accountability tree. Thanks, John. Uh, You're welcome. And before we wrap up, I just wanted to uh, to uh, note that the uh, word accountability here. Uh, is the ability to account for the truth. Yeah. So John has there my truth. Um, it all begins with, uh, we, you know, with our shorthand now is I'm being accountable to myself, but that, that's, uh, the, this is account as an accounting, right. not as in blaming right. or assigning responsibility. No, yeah. no this is, I, I'm able to account. Or another way to say that is I'm able to tell the truth about what's going on with me. Yes. And where I so find myself. That's where the name of the practice comes from for right. wondering. It's a so, good point because you, you looked that word up in the dictionary and it actually says blameworthy. Yeah. Uh, held liable, like punishable. Exactly. Uh, and that's no, that's ex no, we don't mean that. Yeah. Like you said, the ability to account for where I find myself. Right. right okay. And so to, to bring it full circle, so as John, you were just saying, if I have the ability to account for <clears throat> my role in creating codependence, addiction, avoidance of behavior, <clears throat> I can also account for my bit role in creating the life that I now choose intentionally. Yes. yes. So, for example, I, <clears throat> I, create the, I set the intention several years ago, I intend to create a world of joy, peace, freedom, community, and health. So when I wake up in the morning, I notice that I wake up into an experience of joy, peace, freedom, community, and health. That's 
I can be accountable for that. Yes. As well as for all of the still unhealed trauma that I live with, but it that unhealed trauma now I live with in this greater world that I have uh, had the grace and power to be able to create intentionally. Yes. And we haven't gotten into this and we don't have time, but um, uh, my faith is I do this with the grace of God. Uh, it's, it's not kind of an individual, personal, egoic thing alone. It's I was given this power by yeah. the, by the power that created created human life. Right. So it's, we all uh, have that. Yeah. Some people say it. Uh, it's my inheritance. Yeah. However, however it works for you. Yeah. Well, John. Okay, I'm going to stop this. Come to the end of our time together. Mm -hmm. uh, boy, that's some good That's some good stuff, my friend. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was. And uh, as always, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, work on this every day. I'm grateful that you you were graced to come up with this and share this with, uh, share this with as many people as you can get to in as quick amount of time yeah. as possible. Yeah, yeah. So uh, before we wrap up, any last minute thoughts that you'd like to share? Um, uh, just gratitude to you, Marty, for um, this podcast and how we we work together. I'm a I'm a um, flock shooter kind of guy, and you you and I together like keeps it on some kind of um, track. And I appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you very much, my friend, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. You got it. All right. Mm. Thank you. Yes.